بس I can get this to leave my screen. Hold on one second. All right. Welcome to Combined Circles 100 Years. I'm Denise Reagan. I am the executive director of the Garden Club. And joining me from our staff is Morgan Pinks, our operations manager, and Corinne Lightfoot, our marketing and membership manager, who many of you may not have met yet. So um, please introduce yourselves today. We would love for you to get to know her. I'd like to thank the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund for supporting programs like Combined Circles with a generous grant. I'd also like to recognize Connie Long and Levon O'Shields, um, who are our co-chairs of Combined Circles. Unfortunately, Connie cannot join us today as she is still recovering from knee replacement surgery. Um, we wish her the very best, but you probably saw Levon when you checked in today. Let's give them a round of applause for the great programming. Please join me in thanking all the volunteers from the Garden Divas who have provided treats for this morning. What a wonderful spread they have created. Please thank them for me. Wonderful. I'd also like to thank all the members of the Board of Trustees who are with us here today. Could you please stand and be recognized? I think Tiffany Davis is here, Lauren Baxter, Irene Woodworth, and Marianne Salas. Am I missing anyone? Thank you so much for being here. And I want to thank all the Garden Club members who have joined us today. Give yourselves a round of applause for gathering at this great program today. I know we have at least six or seven circles represented here today, maybe a few more. So thank you so much. Four circles are meeting immediately after this program and tables are set up for you in the back. I'd like to tell you about some upcoming programs that we have, including the next combined circles. Uh, Jeremy Marquis of Marquis, Latimer and Hallback will be joining us as he discusses the landscape um, project that he has done for the Garden Club uh, campus along with his firm. Um, the vision is to build a resilient landscape for the next 100 years of the Garden Club. And we would love for you to come to that program that is March 21st, right back here. Um, we have our Forvalia program that's coming up later this month on January 26th. Learn to create a design consisting of three or more groupings of plant material with strong parallel placements. The placement may be vertical, horizontal, or diagonal. There's all sorts of parallel designs that um, are really exciting, and I know that the members of Floralia would love to see you on January 26th. Our next horticulture corner program is called Wild for Wildflowers. It's on February 7th with Master Gardener Mary Loganbach. Um, she discusses how to grow wildflowers in your landscape using the Florida-friendly landscaping principle, right plant, right place. And then our next budding gardeners programs is on terrariums, terrarium treasures. As you know, a terrarium is a miniature garden grown inside a container, and it's a perfect way to enjoy plant life in a small space. It's also an excellent tool for learning about the water cycle, as it demonstrates evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. Children will make their own terrariums and take them home to enjoy, so please, if you have uh, children or grandchildren, nieces, nephews, please um, sign up for this program because it's a wonderful opportunity to learn more about gardening. We have our flea market coming up February 25th. How many people have booths at the garden club for the flea market? Wonderful. So lots of participation in there. Um, it's a great opportunity to find fantastic finds from homes all over the uh, city. Um, we would love for you to participate either as a volunteer. So if you're not, uh, if your circle is not um, participating as with a booth, you can still volunteer by going to the, um, helping out in the uh, uh, boutique or at the board of trustees table. Um, you can also donate items. So just because you're not selling <laughs> items, you can still donate to the garden club and we will be happy to um, give them to new homes because it's a great way to reuse and recycle. So. February 25th is the flea market. February 24th is the preview party. That's where the best selection is. So please join us for that. And lastly, Blooms Galore and More, a giant plant sale that all of you are really a big part of. I know a lot of you have already met and talked about what you're doing to donate plants to the Blooms Galore and More. How many of you are still are planning to participate in Blooms Galore and donate plants? Wonderful. If you're not, I know that um, we have several chairs who are gonna be contacting you to try to drum up um, more business so that we can have a really great plant sale. Um, it's also a great opportunity to visit vendors who are gonna be all over the campus 
selling plants, selling soap, selling honey, and all sorts of things. So that is April 8th, and then the preview party is on April 7th. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Emily Cottrell is the Assistant Archivist and Current Interim Archivist for the Jacksonville Historic Historical Society. She obtained her bachelor's degree in history from the University of North Florida and is currently completing her master's degree in history at UNF as well. During the beginning of her master's program, she held an internship for the Jacksonville Historical Society, where she was able to assist the organization, preservation, and digitization of the Garden Club of Jacksonville collection. Emily's historical work has focused primarily on the importance and development of female agency and power across various times and cultures. We are so excited to have her with us today. If you have questions for Emily, we have um, someone with a microphone, I believe it's Corinne, is gonna be wandering around. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. I don't know, Emily, do you want questions during or after? So if something, if you have a burning question that you know, comes up as she's talking, please raise your hand. We'll get it over to you because we want to capture your question on the recording. And, um, and then we'll have a short Q&A afterward. And now it is my great pleasure, pleasure <laughs> to introduce Emily Cottrell. Thank you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me in the back? Yes, perfect. That's what I like. No issues with the mic today. So thank you all for having me here. It is genuinely a pleasure. Most of my days are spent in a small office with lots of books and photos. So it's nice to see some living faces today. It's genuinely a pleasure. Um, as I was so nicely introduced, I am Emily Cottrell. I am currently the assistant archivist and the interim head archivist at the Jacksonville Historical Society. And although uh, I've been here for the Historical Society on staff about seven months, I was volunteering and interning for about a year and a half prior to that because during COVID I was unemployed. I didn't have a lot of better way to spend my time. So I figured why not give back to the community? So I was lucky enough to be selected from a group of, U of UNF interns to participate in the recording of the Garden Club's history. And I was genuinely surprised by the entire process and all the amazing things I discovered about the Garden Club. So that's kind of what I'm gonna discuss here today. So first I'd like to just kind of discuss our organization in case anyone is unfamiliar with the Jacksonville Historical Society. So we are a nonprofit historical society who have the mission to strengthen citizenship by engaging and educating Jacksonville's people about their history through preserving and sharing the evidence of the city's past and by advocating the value of historic preservation. My role in the archives is to basically take old materials, things you might find in an attic space or things you might typically see in a museum, and I make sure that they're in a good condition and they stay around for a hundred more years. Fingers crossed. <laughs> as long as there isn't another great fire, fingers crossed. So my job is to take these materials that are given from anyone in the public. So if you guys have anything in your attic that you're looking to get rid of and you think it might be important enough, bring it on down, I'd love to see it. I take these materials, I process, I process them and convert them into a way where they're going to be able to sit on a shelf and be looked through and be accessed for research, for events such as this, and really for anyone's curiosity in a way that's safe and it's not going to cause anything to rip or be damaged. This was the job I undertook with the Garden Club's collection. So I'd like to discuss first the kind of processing and preserving of the Garden Club's history and the glorious collection of materials that we received from this institution. And it's a long, it's a long process. So I'm gonna walk you through kind of each step because it definitely undergoes a large transformation. So originally in about July of 2020, we're going back almost you know, two and a half years now, um, Denise Reagan and our previous archivist, Mitch Heeman, began getting in touch regarding the Garden Club's collection. Now the Garden Club's collection consisted of more, many dozens of scrapbooks. We have hundreds of photos. We have objects such as gavels that were used at circle meetings and at Garden Club meetings as well as we had some film negatives and really anything else you could think that the Garden Club might create during their events, we ended up getting a bunch of. So in total, there were thousands of items that were given to us. 
And they started out in a state of, you know, things you might find in your house. So they were in boxes or in kind of plastic bins or just kind of stacked on top of each other. Now, in terms of preserving, that's not the best way you want to keep stuff. So we knew that we had kind of a undertaking there. So luckily, in October of 2020, your board of trustees voted to donate the materials to the Jacksonville Historical Society so that we could maintain them for the future and make sure that anyone who wanted to learn about the history of the Garden Club was able to do so. So the materials that started out in boxes and on carts and kind of stuffed wherever you could went through a journey. Now, by the end of 2020, the materials were fully moved to the Jacksonville Historical Society, which took a few trips because like I said, it wasn't a small amount of stuff. And these materials were then in January of 2021, they began the process of becoming preserved. So in January of 2021, myself along with another intern from UNF named Ethan Levitt, we were selected to work on the Garden Club's collection. Um, I know you can't see this photo, but it's a lovely photo of myself and Ethan in a little office. Um, <laughs> so originally this process kind of started out in a way you might think when you're going through your, your closet or your house at home. It begins with us going through every single item, figuring out what in the world is this, what does it relate to, and how does it fit into the Garden Club's history? So we did not have an easy task because as you know, the Garden Club has many circles and each circle kind of runs its own thing and then comes together sometimes like this combined circles event. So we kind of had to be very creative in the way we organized this collection. So we originally started out by going through every scrapbook, figuring out what circle it pertained to, what years it pertained to, and where it fit in the kind of larger timeline of Jacksonville Garden Club history. Now, the process of just sorting through the materials took weeks on end. And then once it was finally organized into a way that was palatable and that we could move through in an efficient manner, we began the preservation and digitization project. So the scrapbooks, we have ones going back to roughly 1920 all the way up to the early 2000s. They were in very different states of being. Some of them were a lot better preserved and some of them were falling apart at the seams, literally. So scrapbooks, if you guys haven't seen, I've brought a few with us. I feel free to come look at them after. The scrapbooks, a lot of the older ones were held together by simple string. It was covers with pages in it and string holding them together. String is a lot stronger than paper, especially old paper that gets brittle and starts to break. So one of the first steps we took was going through each of these scrapbooks and removing any metal or any binding that was holding them together. So that way, when you went to go through them, you're not ripping the pages, you're not breaking them out. It's a way where you can take them out and look at them in their entirety and you're not going to have something that's crumbling apart. It's also a lot cleaner that way. You would not believe the amount of little pieces of paper that ended up on the floor of our office. I mean, we could have built a whole new garden club building from just those little scraps of paper. I, I promise you, it was so much. So we finally took all the pieces apart that we knew were gonna harm the items in the long term, and we began the process of digitizing them. Now, digitization is a really big word that I can't pronounce and I can't spell half the time, but in general, it's the process of taking digital photos of the scrapbook pages. So it's us, primarily me, sitting at a desk with a very large scanner for hours on end, scanning every single page and every single pamphlet on a page and every single page of a pamphlet on a page to make sure that every single little detail that is preserved in this scrapbook, we have an image of that can be blown up so that anyone who can see it with or without glasses, so it can be used for presentations like this. And so that anyone who wants to find out this information, all they have to do is look on a computer. Now, unfortunately, Ethan was only with us for a semester because that's how long the UNF internships last. I was so enthralled with the Garden Club that I decided to stick around for another semester and help out. You guys did that. I'm so happy. You guys are amazing. 
I love the collection. And you guys, honestly, I would say without the Garden Club collection, I don't think I would be in the place that I am. It was this collection that made me realize that, you know what, maybe I don't want to go become a teacher. Maybe I want to go into archives. People are fun. I love you guys. Kids, not so much. So definitely, I would say the Garden Club collection really was my stepping stone to where I am today. So for that, I'll be a, I'll forever be grateful. Now, Ethan, like I said, he couldn't stick around for the whole thing. So we had a, another intern who joined us named Tova. She was also a history student from UNF. We were lucky enough to be invited to one of the open houses here at the Garden Club. So we got to meet everyone and discuss this process a little bit. And Tova, she came into the process where we had completed most of the scanning and the digitizing and taking photos. And now we basically just had to create some way of finding everything. Because if you have thousands of items, that means you have tens of thousands of scans. And that's a lot of stuff to go through when you're looking for one little name or one little event. So we had to find a really good way of making it so anyone here or anyone anywhere could call us and go, hi, I wanna know this about the Garden Club's history. Do you have something? And we could very quickly look at a few sheets and go, yes, we either do or no, we don't. So this is kind of the process of creating finding aids or creating documents that list out, these are exactly what scrapbooks we have. These are the dates they address. These are the topics they discuss. These are the people that are within them. And that does not take a short amount of time either. That was a whole semester we spent basically creating Excel documents and Word documents. Um, as someone from a younger generation, I am not super familiar with Excel and Word, so it definitely helped me in that sense because I am now an expert unintentionally. I'm, I really feel like way back in middle school when I was forced to take one of those like office like classes and they were supposed to teach you all that stuff and I had no idea what I was doing. If I went back to my teacher now, he'd be so proud of me right now. I could probably teach that whole class just based off of creating the stuff for the garden club. And so when I say that there was a lot of stuff for us to create these finding aids for, we have scrapbooks from nearly 20 different circles. And from what I've gathered, looking back at some of the old newspaper clippings in these scrapbooks, that is only a tiny portion of how many there used to be. At one point, I believe there was 170 different circles that were active in Jacksonville. So we have the scrapbooks for nearly 20 different circles. We have scrapbooks for nearly 20 different events. We have roughly 10 scrapbooks for the larger garden club that were kind of put together on a collective scale. We also have a bunch of editions of the Gordonia, which were a publication that were put out by the garden club. We also have scrapbooks filled with clippings from the Times Union of Garden Notes, which was a weekly run segment that was put out by a member of the Garden Club discussing events that were going on, as well as just little tips and tricks for gardening in Florida, because Florida is a beautiful place, with lots of wildlife, and lots of lots of plants and then beauty, but it still takes a green thumb to, to pull out a garden in Florida. I have not mastered that yet, so I might have to take Denise up and come to one of these amazing events you guys are hosting, because if you ask my husband, if I like even look at a plant, it dies. I promise you. I, that's why I work with like paper, which is dead trees and not living trees, because I would, it would just not work out for, <laughs> for me. So we had a lot of stuff to create these finding aids for. And so collection accessibility is something that we created these. So accessibility just means the ability of someone to access these materials. Us as the Jacksonville Historical Society, we are a public research institution, meaning anyone who wants to walk in or wants to you know, email us and go, I wanna know something about Jacksonville, I'm looking for anything on this type of material, they can do so. You don't have to be a researcher, you don't have to be a historian, you could be someone who bought a house and is like, I wanna know what my house was back in whatever year it was built, who lived there. So the Garden Club collection is no exception. We wanted to make sure that anyone who wanted to learn about the Garden Club was able to. They didn't have to come all the way down here, become a member, chit chat here and there, pick up little bits. They could come to us and they could figure out everything they needed to know. So we did a few different approaches to make sure that this collection would be available to everyone, including everyone in this room. So if you guys ever wanna come see it, I, like I said, I love to see friendly faces that are alive and not in photos. 
also, we have a website that we use that keeps track of all the materials in our archives. We were able to put every single scrapbook into that into that database. So that way people on our website, jackshistory.org, can actually go and search up stuff from the Garden Club collection and see if we have it. We also, like I said, scanned every single scrapbook and every single page of the scrapbook and every single page within a page within a page within a page in the scrapbook. And we made sure that those were online as well. And so Denise multiple times so far has asked us for images and we were glad that we had them. It's, super, it's a lot easier to have these online somewhere because I could be at home and Denise could like, you know, email me and be like, I need these. And I'll be like, okay, cool. Here's a link. Go look through a hundred photos, pick out which ones you like best. So we wanted to make sure that everyone could get them that way. We also, like I said, created an Excel sheet, which lists out, this is the scrapbook. This is who it's about. This is what years it covers. This is where it is in our archives. This is the state it's in. Just to make sure, you know, nothing gets lost because that's what we don't want with a collection this big is we don't want things going missing. I don't think we would notice it would go missing and that's worse because of how big this collection is. But that's what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that this collection was open and available to anyone who wanted to come see it. Anyone, whether it's a Garden Club member, someone from abroad, someone in a different state, anyone who wants to learn about Jacksonville history can see what the Garden Club has done to influence it because I'm not a native to Jacksonville. I moved here to go to college um, a handful of years ago. And before working on this collection, I would not in a million years have guessed how in touch with the community and with the development of Jacksonville, the Garden Club was. So I would like to kind of focus now on what we can learn about the Garden Club from this collection. So like I said, not from Jacksonville. Unfortunately, I'm not a member of the Garden Club. We can maybe change that, guys. Like I said, I would love to learn to not kill everything that I touch. That would be really great, especially in Florida. But the Garden Club was so in tune with the community in terms of philanthropic and charitable events to having every mayor you could think of coming to every single Garden Club event, to working with schools, working with the public systems of Duval County. The Garden Club was so active and so influential that I don't think we would have the Jacksonville that we have today, at least in the way that we know it, without the Garden Club. And this is just me coming in from a completely out of nowhere, knowing nothing about Jacksonville, nothing about the Garden Club, and going through this collection this is what I've discovered. So I'd like to share with you guys some of the important Garden Club events that I saw recorded in these materials, as well as some of the magnificent projects the Garden Club undertook over the years that this project really highlights. So first, we have the first annual flower show. Um, there are some conflicting dates on this. So I brought the images with us. I have plenty more, so feel free to come up and see them. So the first annual flower show, on the photos, it says that it was held on April 25th, 1923. We have some other sources, like some books that were donated to us with this collection that said it was held, I believe, the 15th and 16th. So we have conflicting dates. So the more material we get from the Garden Club, the more this kind of story shines and, and becomes illuminated because something that happened 100 years ago isn't exactly you know common knowledge now. It's not something you're discussing all the time. So if anyone has anything related to the first flower show, we would love to have it because I'd love to be able to say 100% this is what happened. But we have the first annual flower show. And so the first annual flower show, like I said, the photos indicate it was on April 25th. So that's the date I'll be discussing. But like I said, it might not have been that date specifically. But we know it was in April. We know it was in 1923. So this show was held on Fisk Street between Riverside Avenue and the St. John's River. Um, from the images, we believe that it overflowed into the Cummer Gardens because, as you know, Mrs. Cummer was the president of the Garden Club at the time. She did amazing things for the Garden Club. So we have these lovely images. So we have Mrs. Arthur G. Cummer was the president of the Garden Club at the time. Mrs. Waldo E. Cummer was the chairman of the show. And we realized from the materials we have that the proceeds of this show actually went to help plant the Riverside School Grounds. So right off the bat, a year after its founding, the Garden Club is already hosting this magnificent show, 
having a whole street blocked off, having presentations from everyone they could find, and the money that they're collecting is going to a school. It's going to help beautify a school and create an environment that is welcoming and supportive for the children who are there. So immediately you see that the Garden Club at its founding moment was an organization that wanted to give back. They didn't just want to have these beautiful lush shows. They wanted to make Jacksonville and make Florida and make the world a more beautiful place for future generations. So we have this initial we have this initial show, which is amazing. I have probably 10 or so images here that we can look at after. So another big event that we have is the purchase of this Riverside lot that we are sitting in right now, which was on July 9th of 1946. So we actually have multiple newspaper clippings that are recording the purchase of this lot. Um, and it's interesting because we have multiple clippings that were found in multiple different scrapbooks because like I said, there isn't one kind of timeline the Garden Club follows. All the circles were keeping their own scrapbooks. So some of them recorded the same event, some of them recorded different events. This obviously was a big moment for the Garden Club because we have found roughly four or five different instances in where the same newspaper clipping was clipped from the Time Union and put into the scrapbook. And I mean, we wouldn't be sitting in this beautiful building if this purchase didn't happen. So I think it definitely was a major event for this organization. And well, interesting thing I actually only recently came upon was a sketch of the proposed design of the building. So the architect was, um, oh, it's escaping me. It was, oh, Randall Sowell, I believe, was the initial thought of, he was the potential architect. And I know we can't see it. I would love to, if you look at this presentation after, you'll be able to see because the building does not look like this now, guys. <laughs> the building that they were planning on creating was this amazing, which this building is amazing, but this one was a modern building with like multiple meeting halls, lecture spaces, exhibits, and even um, an arbitorium full of Florida plants. So clearly it was a little bit bigger, probably a little bit more expensive than what this building ended up costing, which, you know, for financial reasons, that's fine. But it's really interesting to see this sketch because I found two instances of this sketch, but I didn't even realize we had this until I was going back through these images to find this. So it just shows that this collection, you can find stuff out of nowhere. You could have looked at it every day like I did for a year and a half and never have seen this one amazing sketch, which I would love to get you guys an image of so you guys can blow it up and put it somewhere here because I think that would be an awesome thing to have. But this collection just kind of has, it's, it's like a, a flower. You don't really know what you're going to find until it blooms and you see it. So the purchase of this Riverside lot obviously was an important event because we have it seen and recorded in multiple places. We also have the Garden Center Cornerstone Placement and Dedication Ceremony, which occurred on June 22nd of 1958. So not only do we have newspaper clippings from this event held in the scrapbooks, we also have a couple copies of the pamphlet that was given out at the dedication. So the dedication was on June 22nd, like I said, and the cornerstone, I believe you can still see it outside in this building. So that's a fun thing because you can actually see in the images, um, which I will share with all of you, you can actually see them placing the mortar on the cornerstone as it's being placed. And this is where you kind of see how important the Garden Club was to not just the social community in Jacksonville, but also the political environment because Mayor Hayden Burns was there for that ceremony and was part of that cornerstone placing. And the mayor doesn't come to just any event. So we have multiple instances where the mayor was not only present at Garden Club events, but was sponsoring it, was donating money, was active in these events. So even if the mayor wasn't a member of the Garden Club, which I mean, we could probably make them honorary members. I mean, if we can agree on that, it might work in our favor but they definitely were involved. And you have the mayor, you also have the Duval County Sheriff's Office, you have Public Works. All of them were involved in these projects and these events that the Garden Club was holding, not just in terms of their guests that are invited, 
but they were on the ground floor planning the event, donating funds to it as well. So the Garden Club, I'm guessing, was very important to Jacksonville, guys. I mean, I don't think, like I said, I don't think the mayor comes, to, I don't think if I called up the mayor, I'm like, you want to come to my birthday party, he would come. Don't think that. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I could be pretty persuasive, but I don't think that would work out in my favor. So clearly the Garden Club has some pizzazz, some, some you know, schmooze and power that clearly I don't have myself. So we have this <laughs> dedication ceremony. And then I would now like to discuss some of the events that I've seen. So the Garden Club is an organization of many events, many, many events such like this. One of events we see is a recurring event called the Camellia Show. We have a handful of recurring events that we have multiple scrapbooks for over 10, 20 years. We have the Camellia Show. We have Pageant of Crosses, which was held around Christmas time. We also have these annual flower shows that they were putting on. So the Camellia Shows I thought were especially interesting just because they were specific flower shows that were centered around a specific type of flower, but they always had these lovely, amazing themes to them. So in 1954, from January 23rd to 24th, you have Symphony of Camellias, which was, in its essence, a mixture of music and flowers. So all of the displays you saw were music themed. You had some displays of floral arrangements that were almost shaped to look like musical instruments or to symbolize some sort of musical tone. And honestly, it was it, it's beautiful. I, I would love to have you guys come and see these images and to see this scrapbook because it is so whimsical and so elegant. And although flowers don't sing, because this is not Alice in Wonderland, so flowers don't sing, you almost hear the music coming off of these images. Now, in 1955, on the same day as January 23rd to 24th, you have Camellias and the Arts, which in turn was Arts and Flower. So not only do you have floral representations of major pieces of artwork, you also have displays that are geared towards local Jacksonville art areas, such as the Cumber Museum or other art institutions around the area. You have them creating displays that are supposed to be representative of specific exhibits within these institutions. And these were collaborative pieces. So these potentially could have been sponsored by these organizations, but we know that this was a community where the garden club was in tune with others. It wasn't kind of sealed off. And one of the ways we know this is because in the 1950 um, Camellia show, the judges were actually the men's garden club. Now, it took me a while working on this collection to find out there was a men's garden club. I had no idea. I just happened to come across it one day and I went, I think I read that wrong. And I read it about three more times and I realized, no, that says men's garden club. So yes, <laughs> the women's garden club had a lot of events. The men's garden club was invited to co-host or to be judges of or to be involved in and the more I dug into what exactly the Men's Garden Club was, how exactly it was involved, I realized that there were more and more smaller organizations that the Garden Club took under its wing and decided to help promote and to do a charitable act and, and to help these organizations with their own philanthropic and charitable events. So the Garden Club really has roots that spread out to everywhere you can think of in Jacksonville. So, these charitable events I'm talking about, I'm going to discuss some of my favorite ones. Um, one of them is the Garden for the Blind. So this was a project undertaken by the Garden Club in 1963 to 64. So the Garden for the Blind was a charitable event. It was constructed by the Garden Club at 2555 Gilmore Street here in Jacksonville, Florida. I don't know if it still exists or not. I believe we did some research and there were talks about transplanting it when the, the area was sold, but I don't believe that ever was actually undertaken. Now, this was intended for anyone who was visually impaired in Duval, anyone. So initially 25 students from the St. Augustine School for the Blind were brought to the dedication ceremony that was hosted for this event. And not only were they present, they performed at a talent show there, they were assisted by garden club members in planting different plants 
And in essence, this was not just um, a garden that was visually appealing because these people were visually impaired. It was a sensory garden. So you had different plants that were supposed to in intrigue all the different senses. You were supposed to be encouraged to touch things, to smell things because, and I'm gonna quote this, this was within the mission statement of the Garden for the Blind itself. The blind or visually handicapped child is sent to public schools in Duval County to enable him to become adjusted to life in the normal world as we know it. Thus, someone must take a special interest in teaching botany, horticulture, landscape design, urban renewal and conservation. In fact, let him see what comes from the good earth. That like gave me chills when I read that and like the first time. So the garden club, because we didn't have a school spe especially for people who are visually impaired here in Jacksonville, the closest one to St. Augustine, they wanted, you, you know, you guys as an organization, you wanted to empower those who were visually impaired to survive and, and to, to excel in, in gardening, something that if you had asked me two, three years ago, if I thought you would have a visually impaired group of people who were running gardens and who were, I, I don't think I would have assumed that because most people think when they say garden, I think it's a visual thing. You guys proved everyone wrong. You created this space for these people who were sometimes overlooked and sometimes just shoved into boxes that they shouldn't have been placed into. You created a space that not only supported them and not only nurtured any potential talent that they had, but a space that was theirs, a space where they could excel and where they could use the talents that we might not have that, that triggered senses that are probably more limited on us. You created a space where you could touch, you could smell your way through, and a story would arise from this space. Now, funding for this, because this obviously wasn't a cheap project, came from, and this is, this is going to, came from all 130 circles. So in 1963, there were 130 active circles of the Garden Club. It came from Mayor Burns himself. You have the county committee for highway who was donating. You have the park service was donating. You have the electric company was donating. You have the Duval County School Board was donating money. You also have the county commissioner. All of these individuals were there on the ground floor in the initial meetings for this project saying, we want to give funds because this is such an important event. This is such an important activity. This is such an important part of Jacksonville. And I, I mean, honestly, I'm not saying you guys should undertake this again and do it again, but I would support this because I, I think that in terms of unique and, and once in a lifetime projects, this was one of them. Now, along with the Garden for the Blind, we have a continual relationship between the Garden Club and the Naval Station, NAS Jax. So during World War II, we do see the Garden Club bringing bouquets and bringing kind of merriment, bringing these lovely flower displays to prisoners of war and wounded soldiers who were coming in back from the war into NAS Jackson, we're at the Naval Hospital there. And then again, in the 1970s, we see the Garden Club delivering Christmas trees to the Naval Hospital because not only were you supporting the local Jacksonville community, you were supporting the larger military community that Jacksonville has as well. You were bringing joy into an environment that sees so much disaster and, and so much violence and so much death. You were trying to lighten up the space. So we see this long-standing relationship between the Garden Club and the Naval Hospital. Now, these are just two of the charitable events that I picked. I come from a military background. My father was in the Air Force, so I had to include the military there because I respect anyone who wants to brighten up the day of a soldier. I respect on a new level. So these were just two of the charitable events I wanted to share with you guys. So thank you all for having me again. Um, I would love to answer any questions anyone has. I have brought images and books. We also have some of the books that we have from the Jacksonville Historical Society on sale. And I would love for anyone who wants to be involved in the future of this project and going through these and kind of setting me straight if I don't get something right, you know, I would love to have anyone involved in that. And I am just so grateful for what the Garden Club has done in the past and what you guys are going to do in the future because 
if this was the last hundred years was amazing, I can only imagine what the next hundred years is going to do. So thank you all. All right, I'm sure that some questions have popped up. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and Corinne and I will try to tag team and, and make it to you. I'm gonna take Mary Ann back here. Did the Garden Club become involved in any Victory Garden projects during the war? So war I have I have not seen any reference to specific Victory Gardens during the war. Um, the main things that we see for the Garden Club during the war are kind of supporting soldiers. We do see this amazing program called Seeds of Peace, which was um, right after World War II. The Garden Club was involved with. It was the project of collecting seeds, whether it be for vegetables, fruits, florals, and sending them to war-torn areas of Europe to help promote the kind of repopulation of these areas. So that, along with the kind of supporting of the military personnel returning to Jacksonville are the two main ways that we see the Garden Club involved with the wartime. Other questions? Now we have Corinne in back. There we go. I'll get her on the side. We have a question on that side. Let Corinne know. I'm sorry, where did the hand go? There you are. <laughs> I just appreciate so much what you have done with the historical society and what you have talked about today. And it makes me think about when you talked about the influence that the Garden Club has had in Jacksonville. I think we still need to have some influence. We have a really bad trash problem in this city. And I... I'm a native. I've lived here all my life. I have never seen the amount of trash along the roads from the beach to the west side in between everywhere. I have contacted the mayor's office. I have contacted city council people. I get nothing. In fact, the mayor's office last year said, well, that's up to the civic organizations in Jacksonville to do something. So I think we ought to do something. I think everyone in here should contact the mayor's office, should contact the city council, and maybe we as different circles take a street, whatever, like we you know, used to or like organizations used to do. I don't know what the answer is, but something's got to get started. And maybe through the historical society, we, we get people involved, get the Jacksonville Jaguars involved. We have you know, a new slogan, make Jacksonville beautiful again. Um, but maybe we should do something. Thank you for bringing that to our attention and how powerful this club really can be. Yes, I'm so glad that I could share that. And it's interesting because there were a few different accounts where um, not only did different circles, let's say sponsor a tract of street where they would do that, but there was one image that I will have to get because it is amazing. It's of a display that was held at one of the flower shows. And this woman had taken kind of this old, wilted um, plant and she had picked up a bunch of litter off of the ground and she put it all in there she called it the litter bug and it was one of those kind of social commentary moments of, of her having the same feeling that you are that we need to protect the environment and and kind of have more respect for where we live for the city for the place that we live and so we do see that and i think that you know if you want to go down that avenue i would love to help you go through this collection and find these instances where the garden club did kind of have that bigger emphasis on let's say litter and we could pull those out and we could create a presentation or something to show you know this is when the garden club was involved let's pick these back up so we have a, a bunch of those and i'd be happy to show you those yeah litter is a huge um personal thing i do i participate in a lot of litter cleanups so i would love for the garden club to head that uh, effort as well questions on either side The pageant of the crosses was at Easter. Ah, thank you. So, because yeah. there were um, there were a few because we had some of the, the scrapbooks for the pageant of the crosses, which never set a specific date. But then we had some other instances where they might have reused some of the displays for around Christmas time. But this is what I'm saying: come set me straight, guys. Because <laughs> all I can say is we have some images of things and unless there's specific dates on stuff, it's really hard for us to interpret. So we'd love to have someone from the garden club sit down with us and go through everything and really set everything right. Tell us exactly what we know, but thank you. Do you want another scrapbook? 
Absolutely. Any scrapbooks that you guys have, I would love to take and add to this collection. Right now, we have scrapbooks spanning from roughly 1920 until about 2003, I believe, is the most current scrapbook we have. Anything in between, because the more documents we get, the more the story gets illuminated and kind of these little holes in the history, the easier it becomes to fill them in. The Men's Garden Club created the Riverside Park Camellia area and they maintain it today. Yeah, so that was one, that's something I've been interested in because the Men's Garden Club, they're still active, but they're not quite as large as you guys, I believe. So if anyone knows the Men's Garden Club, if they have any history that they want to share with us as well, we'd love to take that. I'd love to intertwine those. All right, and one quick, here we go. And can you tell us about what you, where are you located? And can you tell us a little bit about the Historical Society location? Yeah, so we are located at 314 Palmetto Street. We are right next to the Vice Star Memorial Arena. The building that we are currently in was formerly Old St. Luke's Hospital from the late 1800s through about 1914 when the hospital moved to the area that is now the UF Health Complex, later to what will become um, St. Vincent's. Um, so it's a great old building, spooky old building. But the Historical Society, we really, we want to work with organizations. What we do is we work with private individuals as well as organizations who find these relics of Jacksonville's history. They donate them to us so that way we can work towards preserving the materials, making them accessible. Because we have, my main job is to not only make sure that these things are stored properly and they're not going to be damaged, but also to use them. Because I have people who email me, call me, I get any type of notification you could think. We get Facebook messages. People who just want to know stuff about Jacksonville history. And so my job is to go through these collections that we have, these items that individuals such as yourselves may have donated, an organization may have donated, and to find where an answer might be for a question that someone has in these items. And so we are a nonprofit. So we have speaker series events similar to this one. We also host different heads of events. Um, Many of you, I believe, went to our gingerbread event that we have at Christmas time, but we are, in essence, just a way to preserve Jacksonville's history for the long term in a setting that isn't kind of ruled by a lot of politics and kind of the ongoings of Jacksonville. Our main goal is to preserve Jacksonville history, whether it be the good or the bad. I would suggest that a great historical society program would be a garden club program. Oh. And I with actually, a bunch of past presidents, which we have, I think, several in this audience right now, as well as many others. So I yes, think that would be great. Luckily, <laughs> we have our events coordinator, Heather Stein, in the audience today. And we have been discussing plans for Women's History Month. And I had coached the idea of potentially having the Garden Club come in and be part of a series that we have and pull out some of the items from the collection to talk about the power of women, even in times when women didn't really have a lot of political power, the social power of women, because like I said, the Garden Club was an iron fist here in Jacksonville. When women were kind of ignored on the political level, the Garden Club made women heard. And so there can be talks about that for Women's History Month, potentially. Cool. I think we have one more question. Corinne, we'll make our way over to you in a second. Did the Garden Club at one time at a home? So I, on a few accounts, I don't think believe there was at one time like one, like this is the like edible garden. Um, many of the individuals who are part of the garden clubs or individual circles would have kind of their own private gardens. And I have seen accounts where like things like horticulture, where more edible plants were focused um, for certain events. Like there's a whole, you know, like you guys have your horticulture kind of speaker series. There was a whole horticulture show that was put on every year. So there was a focus on edible plants as well in terms of that. And like I said, you have these things like seeds of peace where you were not only growing edible plants yourselves, but you were sending seeds, uh, seeds overseas to places that didn't have food at the time so they could rebuild their environments as well. So yes, outside of flowers, you also do have the growth of food.
we give a big round of applause to Emily? I encourage you to come up and look at uh, the um, materials that she's brought with her today and, um, and to contact the Jacksonville Historical Society if you're interested in learning more about this collection. And, um, you know, they're a great resource in so many ways, not just for their garden club work, um, but, uh, you know, and their programs are fantastic. I go to many of them and they are well worth it. Um, we would like you to take our survey, which we'll send to you in an email afterward. But you can also scan the screen or um, we'll uh, send, it, send you a link afterward. Um, we really want to hear your feedback about this program. I know that the screen is not as bright as you would like it to be. You know, when you're, the room is flooded with light, it's really hard to get that um, picture that we want. We are working on getting a high-powered laser projector that will cut through ambient light. We're in the process of working uh, with that, but we did receive a grant for that purchase. So we're working very <laughs> steadily toward that. I can't promise that it will be here by the next um, combined circles in March, but our, our um, plan is to have it installed by the end of March. So help us on the way. <laughs> but this program was recorded, and so you can see the full presentation and all the slides there as well. Um, I want to thank you all for coming and being part of this program. You know, these programs aren't half as fun without your participation, so we really do appreciate it. Please enjoy the uh, the presentation, the the um, materials that are here. And if you are meeting afterward, your tables are ready for you. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>